Hello everyone, Andy Wolverton here with my monthly report on new film noir releases on Blu-ray. And there's some great news. Noir Vember is here. After a month of horror dominating the new releases, it's time to unleash a different kind of dark side. One filled with the messy elements of human nature, which we all know. Greed, desire, deception, betrayal, despair, all the things we love. I've got several good and some great releases for you, so let's get started. Flickr Alley is a company that's been responsible for several collaborations with the Film Noir Foundation, but we have two releases on November the 2nd that may be their greatest projects yet. Two terrific films from Argentina. Also know that these releases come in dual Blu-ray and DVD formats together in the same package. Both releases are also region free. First, we have The Beast Must Die, directed by Vinoli Barreto. And this is based on the 1936 novel by Nicholas Blake, using a pen name for Cecil Day Lewis, father of Daniel Day Lewis. So that's interesting. The Beast Must Die finds mystery writer Felix Lane, played by Narciso Ibanez Minta mourning the death of his nine-year-old son, killed in a hit-and-run accident. Now, Lane doesn't even wait for the authorities to investigate. He changes his identity and searches for the killer himself. Yet, Lane's investigation takes him to some places he isn't prepared for. This release includes an introduction by Eddie Muller, a conversation between Argentine film archivist and historian Fernando Martin Peña, and Daniel Vinoli, son of visionary director Roman Vinoli Barreto, a profile of actor Narciso Ibanez Menta by film historian Fernando Martin Pena, an audio commentary by author and film historian Guido Segal, a souvenir booklet with an essay by Segal, as well as rare original photos, posters, lobby cards, and advertisements. And the second Flickr Alley release, The Bitter Stems, or Las Talos Amargos, from 1956. Okay, I've got a lot to say about this one, so bear with me. The story behind this one is almost as compelling as the film itself. Las Talos Amargos won the Argentine Film Critics Association's Silver Condor Award, designating the country's best film in 1957, with Fernando Ayala picking up the Best Director Award for the film. While lauded in Argentina, the film remained virtually unknown to the rest of the world for decades. Even Eddie Muller was unaware of the title until his friend and cinephile, collector Fernando Martin Pena, showed him a 16mm print of the film. Now, if Pena's name sounds familiar, it's probably because he was responsible for discovering the complete version of Fritz Lang's Metropolis a few years ago. Well, Muller was knocked out by Los Talos Amargos, and even though he saw it without English subtitles, he knew he had to find a print of the film he could restore and share with the world. Thankfully, Pena found a deteriorating negative in a private residence outside of Buenos Aires, and the Film Noir Foundation went to work. So, the story. An Argentine newspaper reporter named Alfredo, played by Carlos Corres, teams up with a Hungarian immigrant named Luidas, played by Vasil Lambrinos, to run a journalism correspondence course scam. Now, all I will tell you about the rest of the plot is this. One of these guys starts to distrust the other, leading to tragedy. American Cinematographer Magazine honored Los Talos Amargos in the year 2000 as one of the best photographed films of all time. So clearly someone remembered the film. Once you see it, you'll understand why. Los Talos Amargos is filled with brilliant cinematography and innovation. The score by Astor Piazzolla, recognized as the world's foremost composer of tango music, is stunning and vibrant, incorporating both classical and jazz styles in a refreshingly powerful way. Now, as you can see, I can't say enough about this film, which is easily in my top 10 all-time film noir titles. Extras include an introduction by Eddie Muller, 
a conversation with Fernando Martin Pena, a profile of the composer Astor Piazzolla by author and film historian Stephen Smith, an audio commentary by Imogen Sarah Smith, and a booklet featuring rare original photos, posters, lobby cards, ads, and an essay by the film historian Maria Elena de las Carreras. This film is my highest recommendation of the month and possibly of the entire year. Please don't miss this one. On November 9th, we have Fury from 1936, directed by Fritz Lang, and this comes to us from the Warner Archive. Traveling through a small Midwestern town, gas station owner Joe Wilson, played by Spencer Tracy, is falsely accused of kidnapping a child. The town's sheriff, played by Edward Ellis, begins to think Wilson is innocent, but a local rabble-rouser, played by Bruce Cabot, whips up the town into, well, a fury. I won't tell you what happens when the inevitable lynch mob comes to deal with Wilson, but Fury is a film you won't soon forget. Many other movies have used this same premise. Um, Try and Get Me from 1950 is one of the better ones, but Fury does its job very well. The picture also stars Sylvia Sidney, Walter Brennan, and this is Fritz Lang's first American film. The 2005 DVD featured an audio commentary by Peter Bogdanovich and interview ex excerpts of Fritz Lang, but it's uncertain whether these will be ported over to the Blu-ray. On November 16th, we have four, count them, four releases from Kino Lorber, starting off with Night Has a Thousand Eyes from 1948, directed by John Farrow. Now, this is based on a novel by Cornell Woolrich, Night Has a Thousand Eyes, also features another collaboration between director John Farrow and screenwriter Jonathan Latimer, also working with Barre Lyndon. Like their later film, Alias Nick Beale from 1949, Night Has a Thousand Eyes features a supernatural element. Edward G. Robinson plays John Triton, a nightclub mentalist slash fortune teller who has legitimate skills but is helpless when it comes to preventing the deaths he sometimes foresees. When an heiress, played by Virginia Bruce, attempts suicide, her fiancé, John Lund, begins to doubt Triton's prediction of her death, thinking something fishy is going on. Is it? This is a fun noir, and I never pass up a chance to see the great Edward G. Robinson. This release also includes a new audio commentary by Imogen Sarah Smith, whose commentaries I also never pass up. Coming up next, we have The Accused from 1949, directed by William Dieterle. Loretta Young plays a psychology professor, Wilma Tuttle, whose student, Bill Perry, played by Douglas Dick, tries to get a little too friendly with his teacher. While fighting off the student, Wilma accidentally kills him, then flees the scene, pretending nothing happened. Ah, but she's a psychology professor with, wait for it, feelings of guilt. Things ratchet up even more when a homicide detective, played by Wendell Corey, starts asking questions, as does the student's guardian, played by Robert Cummings. Does Wilma stand a chance? A somewhat standard story, but the acting and direction are very good. The Accused also includes a new audio commentary by film historian Eddie von Mueller. Next, we have Among the Living from 1941, directed by Stuart Heisler. I really like this one. Albert Decker stars in a dual role as twins. One, a successful industrialist named Paul... The other, his dangerously insane brother, John, who has been, unbeknownst to Paul, hidden and sheltered by the family physician, Dr. Saunders, played by Harry Carey, since the boys were 10 years old. John soon escapes his attic prison and flees into the city, finding an alluring young woman named Millie, played by Susan Hayward, who doesn't know she's dealing with a madman. The cinematography by Theodore Sparkles 
combines traces of Southern Gothic and horror with the shadowy depths that we come to recognize from film noir. The sets and the production values might look like a B picture, but director Stuart Heisler moves the story along at a rapid pace. In fact, it's a very rapid pace at only 67 minutes. But this release does contain a new audio commentary by professor and film scholar Jason Nay. And our next and final one from Kino Lorber is Deported from 1950, directed by Robert C. Odmack. Now, the folks at Blu-ray.com categorize this picture as film noir, romance, thriller, crime, drama. This movie doesn't know what it is. It's loosely based on the deportation of Italian-American gangster Lucky Luciano from the United States to Italy which you can Google. Deported chronicles the deportation and the aftermath for the Luciano-like character named, and this is an exciting name, Vic Smith. Vic Smith is played by Jeff Chandler, and Vic discovers that, hey, I can work it in Italy just as well as I did in America. Plus, Vic falls for a rich Contessa, played by Marta Torin, and there you have it. It's probably better than it sounds, especially considering that the picture is directed by Robert C. Odmack and shot by William H. Daniels. No word on extras. And we close out Noir Vember on November the 30th with Party Girl from 1958, coming to us from Warner Archive. Now, this color film noir from Nicholas Ray focuses on two people who want to abandon their underworld connections. Mob lawyer Thomas Farrell, played by Robert Taylor, and chorus girl Vicky Gay, played by Sid Charisse. But mob boss and sadistic killer Cookie Lamott, played by Lee J. Cobb, isn't having any of it. The use of color and cinemascope improve what is basically a rather routine script, but Nicholas Ray keeps things interesting, especially with showcase cinematography by Robert J. Bronner. And Taylor does a fine job, while Charisse is very good, performing two impressive dance numbers. Lee J. Cobb does well, but he's played this type of role so many times, how could he not be good in it? I only saw this one once years ago, and I'm eager to revisit it. No word on extras, which probably means there aren't any. So, uh, you have some really, really good choices for your Noir Vember. We've still got several days left in October, so if I hear of any updates, I'll be sure to pass them along to you. So everybody take care, stay safe, and watch some great film noir.